Hello everybody, today we will talk about the electromagnetic compatibility. So uh, the electromagnetic compatibility is just one of the uh, requests from the legislation that all of the electronic devices that are uh, sold on the EU market or worldwide um, should comply to. So um, why sh electromagnetic compatibility in the first place? First of all, it is one of the requirements but there are also others like the safety as you heard and the restriction of hazardous substances and the uh, different uh, safety and environmentally related issues so talking about electromagnetic compatibility um, requires some knowledge of electrical engineering while all the rest is the materials and the how to say the manufacturers are relying on the material suppliers so that they supply the components with adequate materials regarding the safety of environment, the uh, fire uh, retardancy, uh, retardancy and therefore you don't have much influence on that. As an engineer developing electronic, compo electronic uh, circuits you are just obligated to take and use the components which are safe and uh, certified in that matter. Uh, and then reaching all the goals regarding safety means more or less um, complying with the rules regarding distances and cooling and that kind of work, which is also important. But you have rules how to do that and um, you just have to comply with them. When we talk about electrical electromagnetic compatibility, it is much harder to, from the beginning, to know what would come out at the end. And um, usually, when it comes to the testing of your device, usually don't know exactly what will happen. And um, it's like a piece of black magic, I could imagine. I mean, there is a book book called Black Magic actually that. Uh, uh, talks about electromagnetic compatibility so it's not just that it's hard to 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 comply with it it's also something that really most of the people don't understand exactly what's going on and it's hard to model it it's hard to calculate it because we are talking about electromagnetic um, phenomena in three dimensions and it's all coupled signals and radiation and back to signals it's all coupled so it is not easy to calculate these things and predict what will happen, especially if you have a very complicated circuit. So therefore, um, we will spend a lot of time during this course to different features um, in scope of electromagnetic compatibility. And today we will talk about the basics, about how the electromagnetic compatibility actually uh, started and what are its main um, things to, to, to consider. So let's go. For, at the beginning I would like to show you this banana skin. Uh, hmm, why I'm talking about bananas now, you wonder, maybe. <clears throat> well, um, there is a website called Banana Skins. And uh, this website is um, uh, gathering different events worldwide regarding the EMC problems and um, get, having an EMC problem as a producer of electronic devices it's like stepping on a banana skin because um, you actually can fall and you can fall very hardly actually what can happen is that your products are called off the market because of that imagine you are producing an automotive headlamp with LEDs that has an EMC problem and you are producing a million of them a year. And what happens if this lamp at a certain stage has an EMC problem? Let's say if someone turns on the light, the radio doesn't work anymore. So hmm, what then? Well, what you can do, of course, um, or what you should do or what the others will force you to is to redraw the, the, the product from the market. And that would cost you a lot. I mean, 
the heads would fall off probably because of that. So that's how is how the EMC can be important, but not just that. Let's go through a few stories that I have uh, gathered for you here. The first one is very, I would say, benign, <laughs> so not dangerous. It was happened in 1997 when the, this lady was showering under power shower and if the guy came by with a computer, the power shower, shower stopped. So the computer was influencing the electronics here and it start, it stopped, stopped working. It, it didn't um, fail, it just stopped working. So it, you could turn it on again. Nevertheless, it was a problem of EMC, obviously, but um, nobody was hurt. This is also quite amusing. There is a car door flap, uh, which contains a high technology, uh, some RFID interface. So the cat had its own bracelet and came next to the door and the door opened for the cat, but only for that one. So if you turned on Windows computer in the room and while the windows were loading in that computer, that door was accidentally opening and sh uh, rattling um, because of the interference. Again, because of the computer turning, uh, loading windows. I don't know if the windows were the problem, just that EMC was the issue here. Okay, nothing dangerous again. Maybe a neighbor cat could come in without a uh, bracelet, but who cares? Okay, that one was very useful. You could, with a cigarette lighter, you could um, open the car park barrier. So um, it opened that you could drive on the car park, which was quite useful. You can't do that nowadays, I suppose, because they uh, settled this thing, right? Okay, the next one. Hmm, this one was a little bit scary. Uh, high power cables in London started to heat up and they were overheating because of a certain phenomena that uh, nobody knew about at that time or didn't anticipate it. The problem was the following and I can actually draw it here if you want so that I can explain that a little bit. So the problem was the following. So the cables were round, right? So I could maybe draw a round cable. Oh, come on. I think I can do better. Okay, let's say this is a round cable. Now, um, there was a, a lot of new computers and um, other um, power saving light bulbs and um, other electronic devices installed in London. And all these electronic devices have um, switch mode power supply to power their electronics. So uh, the thing is, and I will draw it down here, is that if you, if, if you have a linear load, like a resistor, it's a linear load. So the current equals what voltage over resistance. And in that case, if you have a sign shaped voltage, you would then have a sign shaped current which will be in phase. So that would be current and this is voltage. Now, what if I have a nonlinear load? Let's say if I have a diode and a capacitor and then something else. Doesn't matter. It's a base of any switch mode power supply. You have a diode and capacitor, at least one. I mean, you have four, but who cares? For, for that uh, reason of explanation, it's enough. So we have a sine voltage and then you have a voltage on a capacitor which is going like that. Right? You are charging it each time and then you discharge it again. Now, why I'm drawing that? Well, because what happens is, sorry, what happened is because of the nonlinear load, the current were actually was actually like that. So it was zero, and when the capacitor was charging, it was like that. And that was zero, and when capacitor was charging. Now if you had a double uh, 
full rectifier, you would have also a negative pulse here. So this caused high frequency harmonics. The frequency of the current went up. And these high frequency harmonics were actually flowing not through the whole cross section of the cable, but only at the edge. Only at the edge. So the resistance, if the frequency went up, then the skin effect distance went down, which is a skin effect distance is this depth at which the current flows, more or less. And consequently, the resistance of the cables went up. And that means also the temperature went up. And this was heating the cables. One light bulb, one computer, it's not a problem. But millions of them causes a big problem. So they had to introduce a certain circuit in every power supply that is above a certain value. They, so they solved it by regulations, by EMC, directives and standards. So what they did, they said every power supply above a certain power needs to have a power factor correction circuit. PFC or power factor correction. And this circuit, what does it do? Well, this circuit actually does the following. It changes the rectifier into a resistor. So what does it do? It follows the voltage if this is the voltage, it follows the voltage and creates a current that has a, the same shape as voltage. So having a circuit that tracks the voltage and then changes the current of your power supply to reflect the voltage shape actually makes anything resistive because resistor does exactly that. So about this was about the London story. It was still not life threatening, I suppose. So the next story was life threatening. So what was here? Actually, what was here is that um, a car. It was a, a, a ambulance car. You can imagine this is an ambulance car. Had a roof, which was metallic. And here was antenna radiating around for communication. And they replaced the roof by a plastic ones. So when the roof was replaced by a plastic roof, the radiation also entered in. And here was a pacemaker. And that pacemaker failed because of that. So each time you communicated with the uh, dispatch uh, officer to, for the, or with the doctor via wireless, phone through this communication interface on the roof of the uh, that uh, ambulance car the pacemaker or that defibrillator actually not the pacemaker the defibrillator died it was a life threatening situation okay the next problem was not deadly, but it was very, very expensive. That is a Magellan spacecraft, which was sent to Venus. And back in 1991 was nearly cancelled because actually um, the electronics was interfering the antennas. So the microcontrollers and the circuits were not functioning properly because of the electromagnetic field from antennas. So they had to uh, cover them with some shielding. It was a problem which was identified just before the launch. And um, then the, they fixed it and it was successfully launched. You can imagine how expensive such an aircraft is. And because there are certain very, very tiny time slots in which you can send spacecraft to, to the universe because of the position of the planets, 
you cannot miss a chance here. And um, that would cost a lot of millions if it wasn't launched at that time. So EMC causing a big million damage, almost. And the last banana skin I want to show is the biggest EMC related um, catastrophic, I would say failure in the, in the history. Uh, what happened in this ship, a military ship, um, when the US was fighting for Falkland Islands, I don't know what they wanted there because there is nothing there. I mean, it's like a desert in the middle of uh, the ocean. So the fight, the problem was that they were fighting for this island and the commander of the ship, the captain, wanted to talk to somebody with a satellite phone. And when the radars were on, the satellite phone wasn't working. So they had to shut down the radars each time the captain was talking. Now, the problem was that just at that time, they, they were hit by a missile because they didn't see the missile of the, because of the radar was off. So it was a EMC related catastrophe. There was another of such uh, catastrophic failure due to EMC. It was an aircraft carrier and one of the missiles on the, one of the planes um, ignited because of the radar pulse and it ignited just by itself and it went off on the parked plane on that aircraft and the aircraft was destroyed. It was also a lot of people dead in, in both cases. I mean, so yeah, EMC as a big problem and life were spent because of the EMC problem here. So, uh, all of that just to show you that EMC is not uh, very, uh, how to say, a marginal problem. Nowadays, everyone, every electronic producer has to do more or less, everyone has to do the EMC testing. And it's always a pain because it's rarely that everything goes smoothly. So talking about EMC, thinking about it, for the whole design is essential to make things as good as possible. So this is an example of how and when you should think about EMC. And I would say you should think about it all the time during the product development. At the beginning, when you start thinking about this product, sorry, is more or less everything available. You can do almost anything. You can influence how the housing is designed. You can influence the position of connectors, which is also important. You can influence what type of cables are used. You can influence everything. And you can choose such a way that your EMC would be the lowest. EMC problem to avoid them at the beginning if you anticipate them. And of course, that costs almost nothing. When you come into the phase of testing, then, yeah, in the testing phase, you don't have a lot of uh, available solution left because you have all the stuff or more or less settled. The housing is settled, the connectors are settled, the way the electronics, the, the components, almost everything is settled because in the testing phase, you already have to have a working prototype. So things are going in parallel. The development goes in parallel of the housing, of the everything, of the software. So back when you find that there is a problem in the testing phase, you start to put things on it. You can put some coils, you can put some shielding, you can do some cabling and so on and so on. And then you just make a big pile of something just that it goes through. So you put all the capacitors around, you can put coils, uh, shields, um, ferrites, stuff that you don't want to use because it's too expensive or too bulky or whatever. But you have to do it because it doesn't go through. So that costs more. And in the 
how to say here when you go to the market you have almost no solution left and the cost if something goes wrong is enormous so thinking about EMC at the beginning is essential to overcome these issues so thinking about EMC well you should think about standards you should think that using EMC standards is the best option so here yeah using EMC standards again very important and then you can um, presume that your assume that your uh, device is compatible you are not 100% certain but following the standards would give this assumption of compatibility there are many standards on EMC and uh, they are divided into different areas first of all we have basic standards these are those who are covering the basics of EMC what we are just talking about uh, defining what different stuff means then we have generic standards which are generic for or they, they are covering generic electronics so they show the levels the what are the minimum radiation levels the um, immunity levels all that for generic electronics and then you have product family standards which are covering different product families like electronics for cars car headlamps uh, and then medical devices and then uh, house consumer devices and then maybe uh, IT and uh, entertainment and uh, TV and stuff uh, these are different areas covering by different standards and then you have a special product standards such as for example electricity meters are very important because you know electricity meters is just a one product and they have their own standard the reason why is because everyone is trying to trick the electricity meter so it has to be really immune to anything I mean people are are firing electrical pulses in, into them they are putting large magnets on them just to to make them work or stop to make them work uh, to, to make them measure lower values or even stop working so they really has have to be immune to everything so that's why they have their own standards and manufacturer standards well manufacturers are I would say trying to um, increase the standard um, requirements because they want to be better than the others so if you're working for a certain certain manufacturer as a, a supplier of some parts maybe they can give you extra requests for a certain um, property of your electronics so yeah it goes harder and harder when you go into the details and there are two standardization bodies which are um, shown here the technical committee 77 is part of the IEC management group and the other is CISPR we say CISPR which are uh, also developing standards of on the um, uh, basis or, or in the field of EMC and there are some product committees which are producing product standards like for example electricity meters which I've shown before and these two groups are um, uh, producing basic generic and product standards and then the organizations uh, which are covering the standardization scheme in the world are then uh, taking their results and issuing standards so these two technical committees are um, consisting of several experts on these fields and the technical committee 77 has three groups three subcommittees covering these three areas so I don't even want to go into detail here the CISPR also covering different fields so yeah and these are as you see very old committees so now going into EMC standards and this is something that you would have to know and the only thing you I would require from you is to know that the generic standard on of the EM on the EMC topic is IEC 61000 something 
IEC 61000 has several substandards, several subdocuments, which are covering all these um, fields, like the fundamental standard are one to five, and they are first defining terms, then they are defining different environments in which the electronics can operate, they are defining then and um, uh, defining the levels of emissions which are permitted and the immunity and then uh, testing, how do you test for that and some cabling and grounding schemes. So you can already follow in these standards some guidelines how to cable and ground electronics. And then we have 61006 which are covering uh, and uh, showing the immunity and emission levels for different environments. And we have two environments, we have industry environment and the rest. The rest is domestic, commercial and light industry and we have heavy industry here. So these are standards are all here. So let me show you maybe, uh, first of all, what are the um, different environments. So in the environment uh, sense, we have um, two environments. We have industrial and we have domestic, commercial and light industry. Industrial is also called class A. So class A, and that's also important, you should remember, class A and class B. So class A is industrial and class B is domestic and light and commercial. So the thing is that in the industrial environment, you have qualified personnel, you have very defined environment, you have a limited time which somebody spends there and they know exactly how to operate the equipment. And even if next to some big heavy machine, a radio doesn't work, it's not a big problem because actually worker shouldn't listen to radio anyway. It's just too loud probably. So anyway, there are higher limits. So you maybe can do less uh, or maybe you, you would just have to spend too much money and energy into the solutions to lower the EMC footprint and uh, that wouldn't pay off. So with these heavy machines, the emission levels are allowed to be higher. So uh, in the class B, when you have a domestic environment, then Anyone, anyone can use it and they are not qualified to use it to use the equipment and they could do anything with it they could put it anywhere and still it should work and the others are, other uh, um, equipment should work as well so you have to be uh, more strict on the levels therefore they are okay maybe going further these are different EMC standards for specific product families. As you can see, you can choose which what you're doing and then you can go into the detail and check out the limits. I will also go, give you uh, some examples. So going into EMC model. Well, the EMC model is consists of three main parts. The first one is source. So you always have, a, you need a source which generates the electromagnetic noise. Then you have a victim. On the other side, you have someone that receives it. So it's a victim and the source is aggressor. And there is a coupling path in between. This is a standard EMC model. And um, Regarding the sources, we have a lot of different sources and we divide them into external and internal. Internal sources are within the electronics itself, like different types of noise. When the external sources are somewhere outside that electronics that is influenced. So the, you could either have atmospheric, like lightning, for example, extraterrestrial, like solar and cosmic rays. And we have a man-made sources, which can be intentional or unintentional. So what does it mean, intentional sources? Well, 
Intentional sources are intentional in that sense that the electromagnetic noise is generated for the device to operate. So all the radio transmitters are intentional sources of electromagnetic field, which for other device is uh, presented as noise, as interference. Unintentional sources is all the rest. Every electronics that has a, some component that switches, I'm not talking about main power switch here, I'm talking about electronic component that is switching on and off very fast, like transistor. So every such electronic device that switches current or voltage very fast is potential noise radiator. It radiates electromagnetic noise because the electrons are um, accelerating and deaccelerating and therefore generating electromagnetic field. So these are unintentional sources because for them to operate, they cannot operate without radiating just a little bit. So there are limits how much they still have to or can radiate or should radiate. Okay, on the other side, we have biological and artificial, artificial victims. Biological are we, but we are not talking about us in the EMC. We are not talking about people and animals because EMC directive is not a safety related directive. It is related just to uh, it's related to um, interference between two devices. And then we have a coupling path. It could be conductive or radiative. So the first one is conductive. So that one is conductive. Yeah. And it is con conductive through cables. And these three are radiative because they can be radiate, they, they do not conduct through the cables, they, they are uh, spreading through the air and in different ways. So what can we do? Well, as electrical engineer, what can I really influence is the source. So we are influencing the source on the first place. The source is the one which we can influence most because we are developing electronics which acts as a source of electromagnetic noise and we can influence on that. Of course, we can decrease the, decrease the coupling path. We can put components or the devices more away from each other. That's the easiest way, but you cannot do that usually. I mean, would you accept having a phone that can have a telephone call when it's at least 100 meters away from your computer? Probably not. So we can do shielding and that would be probably it, or filtering. At the other side, we do not have influence on the victim, unless the victim is actually us. If we are the victim, if we are developing electronics, which, is, which can be victim, and usually it can be to some other noise sources, then we have to decrease the sensitivity of our electronics. So yes, we can also influence the victim, but only if the victim is a part of our electronics. So these are limits which you uh, can check in the standards and these are limi limits from generic standard EN61000. So only these, because what you can see is there are European limits and there are FCC American limits. And this European for class A and for class B, you see they are different. And for America also. So if you want to um, sell device in America and Europe, you should look at the American limits. If you want, if you have, uh, let's say one peak that is like that, then you can still sell in Europe, but not America. Let me show you some things more. First of all, what is shown here, it says 
conduction. Conduction means that this noise is conducted via cables. It is measured from 150 kilohertz up to 30 megahertz. So that's one thing that you should remember. And the other is that it is measured in dB microvolts at the main terminals using this equipment. So let me summarize, because this is again something you will have to remember. So remembering, yeah, a lot of things have to be remembered here. I'm sorry, but that's how it is. Um, so what you should remember here, conductive limits, okay? Okay, conductive limits are measured from 150 kilohertz up to 30 megahertz, and radiate. Sorry, and the no, and the levels are dB microvolts. So we are measuring in decibel microvolts. How do you calculate decibel microvolts? Where how you do that? It is 20 logarithm with the base of 10 voltage in volts divided by 1 microvolt. Yeah. Like that. So why is it measured from 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz? I will tell you a little bit later in, let's say, 20 minutes. Okay, these are limits for radiation emissions. Again, pay attention, radiation em limits. Now we are measuring noise that comes through the air. And the limits, again, are different from America and Europe. And again, and here I also show some German standard limits which are somewhere in between but what you should know in europe we only look at the red lines at the european norm america they looked at the fcc since the germany is in europe we should look at european limits if you comply with german okay but you would have maybe you would have to comply to this and then here using German and here again European. That would be then for Germany. The uh, frequency range comes from 3 mega, 30 megahertz up to 1 giga, but this is only for generic electronics. For a special product, we could go up to 6 giga, let's say for some telecommunication equipment and IT. And uh, the, the measurement units are dB microvolts per meter. So actually we are measuring electric field amplitude. And normalized to a distance of 10 meters. So again, going back, another thing you should understand and remember is that for radiative noise, We are measuring from 30 megahertz up to 1 gigahertz and the units are dB microvolts per meter which are 20 logarithm electric field measured in volts per meter over 1 microvolt per meter. Again, I have to zoom out because I'm just typing too big. Okay, so hmm. let me show you a few examples then, because these are generic standards. But what if you go into a product standard group, let's say car electronics or cars in general and ignition engines and stuff, then we have totally different radiation limits. In CISPR 12 standard, we have limits which are much different, but not 
not lower than here actually they are more they are higher mm. but there is a big difference I can show you exactly where the difference is um, the difference is in this value here here we measure at 10 meters here we measure at one meter so 10 times closer and this is harder but why do we measure at one meter in car industry because all the electronics everything is in the car and influences other stuff in the car so you have to look for radiation in one meter vicinity of the electronics and you see this device passed the test but why do we have two limits because we are always measuring two values depends it doesn't i mean in the radiation or conductive noise measurement we always measure two values we measure peak and we measure average average and peak and this is average and peak again this is average and this is peak what does it mean why do we do that well because actually the signal of the noise it's maybe not constant so maybe noise is not like that in this case the peak and average value would be related very closely but sometimes it might be like that and then the average noise is quite low but the peak is high so they always measure both this is example of CISPR 25 class 5 uh, CISPR 25 for car industry is intended for electronic circuits inside the car and it's the hardest standard you can have in cars so here you see a lot of levels at different frequency ranges and um, it is measured at one meter this CSPR 25 has five classes and this is the hardest class five and these are the limits so this barely um, got in the class five okay um, so in EMC we have different classifications we are talking about emissions on one side and we talk about immunity on the other so we have to assure that our device does not emit and it's immune and in emissions and immunity we talk about three subcategories which is radiated conducted and low frequency magnetic fields radiated emissions and immunity is um, talking about electromagnetic fields which are spreading through the air conducted about the uh, voltages and currents running through the wires and low frequency magnetic fields is talking about mostly about 50 hertz electric uh, sorry a magnetic field that comes from the um, transformers and other electric appliances and um, in detail we then have different frequencies different conductive and radiated phenomena and won't go into the detail here I would rather go now into the modeling of the EMC so from which you will be able to understand and to deduct what kind of um, what kind of phenomena took place when you had a certain problem because I must say that um, distinguishing different problems and getting to the bottom of the matter is like um, going to a doctor when you have a fever 
and the doctor would say, well, uh, either it's um, virus or it's bacteria. Okay, let's, he will test your blood and he will um, find out what's the reason and then he would give you some remedies. Like for a virus, you would just get a painkiller of some kind. For bacteria, you will get antibiotics. If he makes a mistake, then he wouldn't be able to treat you well. Taking antibiotics if you have a virus doesn't make any sense and vice versa. Uh, if you have bacteria and he doesn't give you antibiotics, then you are going worse. So finding out what is going on in each of those cases of EMC is essential for you to find the proper um, response, to the proper measure to uh, solve the problem, a proper medicine if you want. So that's why we will now go into this EMC modeling a little bit more in detail. Here I show you the basic of EMC. Um, regarding the um, here we have the source and here we have the victim so the source can spread the noise over the air which is radiated emission then the current can flow through the cable so that would be conductive emission but that because the cable is along it can act as antenna so it can transform itself to radiation emission again. And here also, the current can flow through the cables, which contains noise, the current, I mean, and that this can radiate again. But it can also travel to the wall socket and then going to the grid and back to the other wall socket and then going back. So again, you get to the victim via the conductive path. So these are conduction emissions. You can also have current flowing through a common ground point. This would be conducted emissions again. And you can have a problem outside your house and comes in through the power cables, through the mains, and it can couple to the victim again, like lightning strike, for example. These are all interference coupling mechanisms. And now I will try to model each one of them separately. First, I will go into capacitor coupling. I will do it once by, one by one. So let's say we have a aggressor that has a certain part of electronics which changes with time very quickly. So we have big delta U over delta T. So we have big changes in voltage, let's say like that. And these changes in voltage are then coupled to the victim via a common capacitance, which I call C12. On the other side, the victim has a certain impedance towards ground. Now this, this voltage change then causes a current flowing through this capacitor. And then this current causes another voltage change on the victim on that internal impedance. So if you couple all that together, we have a combination of the source, which is du over dt. We have a coupling path and we have victim. As I said, you cannot influence the impedance of the victim. You can influence the path by shielding, filtering, and you can influence the source by making this du over dt smaller. You can imagine on a PCB, I will draw a PCB now here. There is a transistor somewhere here, okay? That transistor switches high voltage, so it has big du over dt on it. That transistor has a big area around of copper because it has to be cooled and now this whole area is having this du over dt and the capacitance is as you know area over epsilon over d so this c12 here is also a consequence of this area here so maybe reducing this area 
would maybe reduce also this capacitance to make it really, really small. Just one example. Um, well, I just modeled this noise transfer in time domain. I could do that in frequency domain as well. It's even simpler. We have a source that has a harmonic signal and we have mutual capacitance and we have input resistance on the other side. And it looks like a capacitance or let's say a impedance divider. So there is a source voltage here and here is the output voltage. And the output voltage is the resistance of the victim over the common impedance, which is a sum of the R input squared plus the capacitance of the, uh, the impedance of capacitor um, and root. So the impedance of capacitor, as you all know, is one over J omega C. Um, let me show you an example. You often used, um, probably you did, often used oscilloscope, right? So we have an oscilloscope here. Okay. I'll try to zoom in a little bit. Okay, so this is an oscilloscope and that oscilloscope has a screen. And then you have inputs here. So let's say we have one input here. And to that input you are connecting the probe. And this probe is shielded in a shield. I can't draw that really well. And it's grounded here. So the probe actually, if you look from the other side, has a small tip. And this is the oscilloscope tip, right? So here, what do we have inside the oscilloscope? We have a resistor towards ground, which has one mega ohm. If you don't know that, check out on the oscilloscope when you see one. And there is a capacitor also, I think around um, 10 picofarad or similar. That's the capacitance of the input. Depends on the type of oscilloscope, of course. So on the other side, you have tip. And then everything is in a building. Right? And in that building, we have very nice the electrical installation around. And light bulbs here. And stuff. Now, if you look at the signal at the oscilloscope, what you would see is a small noise. If this is not connected anywhere, you have a small noise. And that noise comes from the mutual capacitance between this tip, which looks outside this coaxial cable, and the grid. So we have a capacitance towards different parts of your house, and these are very, very small capacitors. So we have a very defined electric circuit, we have 300, 230 volts AC, we have this common capacitance, and we have more or less one mega ohm and this 10 picofarad here. Now, that seems okay. What now? Um, let's say we touch this probe. What happens if we touch the probe? The signal will go bananas, like that. So what do we actually do with touching the probe? We increase the area of our capacitor, because now it is us touching the probe, and the area now is much bigger. So the capacitance has an area that increases and since the capacitance increases also the the noise increases how am i sure that this is the capacitive coupling not something else well 
I'm quite sure because I know what is required for the capacitive, capacitive coupling to happen. And for capacitive coupling, we need capacitance, which certainly is. We need change in voltage, which we have. And we need impedance. The higher the impedance, the better. In our case, we have one mega ohm. So I think that I'm quite fine with that. Okay, so don't remember, uh, sorry, don't forget, <laughs> don't forget uh, this basic assumptions. Inductive coupling is very similar. For inductive coupling, we need Another. For inductive coupling, we need current that changes in the loop. We need common inductance. And here we have voltage that is generated as an inductive response to it. so the induction principle. And that voltage then causes the current flowing in the loop. So our source is now the here. This is the path. And this is the victim. And the lower impedance victim, the larger current is passed. And in terms of um, harmonic circuit, the frequency domain, we have again uh, impedance or admittance a divider. So this is the admittance of resistor, this is the admittance of coil, and we have the whole admittance of the resistor again, or the of the victim. And the current is divided such, if the resistance of the victim goes down, then the current goes up. And uh, what would be the example of that? Um, let me show you an example. It's not easy to find an example for a high magnetic coupling because usually in our houses, in everyday life, we do not have very large currents flowing. Maybe some heaters, but not, uh, not usually. I mean, we are not usually exposed to these. So, um, let me show an example. And uh, the example is the following. I used to work uh, with uh, some institute, uh, a metallurgic institute, which had um, this instrument. Um, this was a measurement instrument that was measuring uh, temperature. Now this had a lot of inputs and each input was actually having two wires and these two wires went to a thermocoupler. A thermocoupler is measuring temperature and the temperature uh, is a function, sorry no, the voltage of the thermocoupler is dependent on the, is a function of temperature difference between this point and this point here. Okay, so that thermocoupler was attached to a big piece of iron and this big piece of iron was connected to a very very strong transformer. Okay, this very strong transformer was carrying thousands of amps, kilo amps into this piece of iron. So it was heated up immediately in a few seconds to glow red. And there was a big hammer then, a very big hammer that was striking this piece and deforming it. So we had to measure the temperature of that piece. And the noise in this signal was like shh. If the signal would be like that, then the noise was shh, like that. 10 times larger than the signal. So there, the, there was 
certainly a big large current flowing here and thermocoupler had lower low impedance here so the noise that was coupling was clearly the magnetic flux so what did we do we took very small ceramic discs or uh, like that and we put them next to each other and each disc had two holes and we put these lines in these cables both cables in in such a way that they went next to each other and then we twisted them like that can you imagine we twisted them to make a twisted pair all the way and these discs were ceramic discs because um, we wanted to be temperature resistive and they were holding these wires in, p in place because the wires were actually non-isolated so by making twisted pair you can decrease the noise magnetic noise coupling why because the magnetic field entering from a single direction actually cancels out here it induces in that direction here in the other and again here such a way so back along the cable the magnetic field must was really reduced because of this twisting of the cable all right uh, we also have um, um, electromagnetic noise um, happening or uh, electromagnetic interference happening on the PCB. On printed circuit board, it is shown here for two lines, two tracks over a ground plane on a PCB depends how far they are apart or if they have ground plane or not you can have different coupling here for example we have two uh, two examples of these two uh, cases when you can show the mutual capacitance and mutual inductance of these two um, uh, lines over a 1.6 millimeter uh, classical FR4 board and you see that when you decrease the distance at larger distances the mutual uh, inductance is lower when you come very close together the mutual inductance becomes larger than the mutual capacitance just to show you what the values are in picofarads tens of one tenth of picarad per farad per centimeter and the inductances are below nano henrys per centimeter just to give you an idea how much is that now what about electromagnetic field interference well, you may wonder, why do I talk about electromagnetic field? Aren't we talking about electromagnetic field all the time? So why do I go and say, okay, what about electromagnetic field? Well, let me show you an example and I hope that uh, we'll manage to understand. Now, um, here I'm showing two sources of electromagnetic field the first one that's this one here is a electric field source so it has a voltage generator which causes voltage difference between these two rods and this electric field then is generating is generated and uh, spreads into the area yeah? now on the other side we have a rod through which a current is flowing and this rod generates according to the rule of thumb uh, the right hand room rule that one um, it generates magnetic field here and this magnetic field also spreads 
into the surrounding area. Now, we can say that the current here is very small. And here we can say that the voltage on this rod is very small. So, we can say that actually here we are talking about really high impedance. And here we are talking about very low impedance. So a high impedance sources are generating mostly electric field and low impedance sources are generating mostly magnetic field. Now, usually what we do have, we do have always a combination of both. There is no voltage without current and vice versa. So always we are generating electric and magnetic field actually, but one of them can be neglected if we are in the vicinity of the source. If we are getting far away from the source like here, then we have a electromagnetic wave. How is that possible? Well, it was established more than 150 years ago by Maxwell and after him by um, uh, another science, a scientist called Heaviside who wrote the telegraphic equation. So Maxwell actually formulated his equations and I would like to show it actually. Keep. So Maxwell formulated his equations and they are here. And Maxwell said, among the others, mostly you are used to these equations here, these are integral equations, and these are, these are the same equations in differential form. Well, Maxwell formed in these equations also established a connection between electric and magnetic field. And he said that the change in magnetic field will cause electric field. And the change in electric field and current will cause the magnetic field. So, if electric field changes, it will cause magnetic field. If magnetic field changes, if it will cause electric field. And Heaviside later um, formulated the wave equation and established that the speed of the transport of that wave is equal to 1 over square root of mi epsilon, which actually, if we put mi 0, epsilon 0, we come to the speed of light. So speed of light then indicated that light is also electromagnetic wave. Now that's cool. So what does it do with us actually? Oh God. Now we have to go back to the slide. What has it has all that to do with our story? Well, it has to do a lot because what actually you should know is that here here we have electric or magnetic field. Far away the field does not feel the source anymore because it's just too far away. And therefore it relies only on each other. Electric field relies on magnetic and magnetic on electric. And they are supporting each other. They cannot live one without, it, without the other. They are like man and wife, you know? So, at the end, far away from the source, we have a established relation between electric and magnetic field which is equal to square root of mi, sorry, epsilon, and this is equal to 377 ohm. So the ratio between electric and magnetic field is not, which, uh, it is not um, dependent on the source, but actually it is dependent on the medium. And it's always the same in vacuum or free space or in air. And um, 
Here we are talking about near field, here far field. Let me show you another picture. This is a picture of a loop antenna. Here we do have a loop antenna. Similarly, it would be for a rod antenna, but we are showing for loop. So we have a lot of current changing in a, in a loop. And therefore, since the voltage of that loop is small, we have a short circuit, the impedance is very low. Now, if the impedance is very low, we have a big magnetic field and it is much larger than electric field, even though the electric field is shown here large, but actually magnetic is much larger. And from this source, the magnetic field falls with a third potential, third, third a pot, uh, pot, potential uh, uh, of the distance and um, here to the square of the distance, cube and square, okay? And um, somewhere they meet because this one is falling faster than that one. So they meet a certain point where they are both falling with the first order. And the ratio here in far field after the, they are away, enough away, and what is enough is actually this one here. This distance is lambda over two pi. So here, from this distance on, we have far field, and we have defined ratio between electric and magnetic field being 377 ohms. Here it could be anything. Well, what does it mean if we go further now? This is an example of impedances, showing the same thing as before in another form. We have a rod antenna, we have electric field here, and this is a loop antenna, we have magnetic field. Now, as you see, if we have electric field source, we have high impedance here, and then it gets it's it lowers lower still the one one means lambda over two pi, and here we have low impedance with magnetic field, and it decreases to when it reaches to this distance. There is a transition region, and then we have this plane wave where electric and magnetic field are connected. Why I'm telling you all that? Well, I would like to show you an example and you will probably figure it out. So this is an example. And um, I would like to write a table. Okay. Okay. So, ah. I will draw a table that has frequency, wavelength, and wavelength over 2 pi. So the distance where the near field becomes far field. I will start with 50 hertz. How do we calculate? Okay, I will just draw a few formulas here just to, to make it easier for you. Uh, so I will draw formulas which we would actually need. So the impedance of the free space is square root of mi zero epsilon zero. And the speed of light is, or the speed is equal to speed of light is one over square root of mi zero epsilon zero. And the Z0 is 377 ohms and speed of light is 3 times 10 to 8 um, meters per second. What else should we know? Well, we should know that the frequency is speed of light over wavelength. So the wavelength is C over F. These are the equations you will have to remember, just to make it clear. So 50 hertz 
wavelength is 600,000 kilometers. And divided by six point something, we are talking about roughly 1,000 kilometers. The next frequency, let's talk about one megahertz. This is 50 hertz. One megahertz would be probably in the range of 300 meters and 50 meters. So you got an idea now. 50 hertz signal coming from mains power supply has a near field properties up to 1000 kilometers. One megahertz signal coming from the medium uh, wave radio transmitter has a me uh, short um, near field distance of 50 meters. Okay. Let me show you 30 megahertz. Why I'm showing 30 megahertz? Because if you remember, we are measuring electromagnetic radiative noise from 30 megahertz upwards. So 30 megahertz would give you a wavelength of 10, let me check, um, 10 meters, I think, yeah. And the lambda over 2 pi would be 1.5 meters. Something. 100 megahertz, 3 meters, 50 centimeters. And let's go 1 gigahertz, 30 centimeters, and 5 centimeters. Now, why am I showing you all that? 30 megahertz, as I said, we have near field up to 1.5 meters. And this is the point also at which we measure the EMC on, because we are measuring at EMC measurement. We are measuring from at three meters and 10 meters to be in far field. But you may remember that I showed you that CISPR uh, 12 and CISPR 25, which actually was measuring at one meter. Well, that was exception because we are in car industry and there you have to know what is going on in one meter distance because in the car we are confined in a very small place. Otherwise, all the rest of the measurement is done at 3 and 10 meters because we want to be in far field. As you remember, we are measuring here only electric component. And if we are in far field, we exactly know what the magnetic component would be. If we measure in near field, we don't know because they are not coupled together and it depends on the impedance of the source. And knowing in which part of the field you are, if you are in near field or far field, is very important because in near field you have to care of the um, electric and magnetic noise separately. So in near field if you have electric field source, then you care about electric field only. If you have both, you have to care for each one separately. You have to shield from electric field, you have to shield from magnetic field. You have to use some shieldings which can act at both fields. If you are in the far field, then you care only about one component. And it's much easier to shield from electric field than from magnetic. So if you shield from electric field, you are on the safe side because the magnetic will di di diminish immediately because it cannot live without it. So that's the reason why you should know what you are dealing with. And then you can find the right recipe to get rid of it. Okay, so again, near field. 
if you have electric field sorry this is strange if you have electric field you have to care for that separately so you have to kill electric field and magnetic field separately if you are in far field then if you you have again both but they are connected to each other so if you kill electric field oh god then your magnetic would cancel as well if you kill magnetic field sorry if you kill magnetic field then the electric would also cancel <laughs> out again so yeah and this really changes the way you approach to the problem so therefore it's very important to know exactly what you are dealing with and then you can find the right recipe to get rid of it and finally i would like to show you just a few slides before we finish as you see i'm also a little bit tired and a few coupling mechanisms so electromagnetic field can couple also through the wires so not just coming from your device from within the uh, aggressor but it could also couple through a wire so you can have current okay i found so you can have current flowing through the wires and then flow through aggressor and back this electric current if this electric current is a consequence of a device of apparatus you are at you are plugging to the power supply usually in that case you would have maybe let's say a, a power drill a power drill has a, this um, collector motor and uh, a lot of sparks are generated there and these sparks are then causing the current pulses coming from the power supply and this current then coming from the power supply causes electromagnetic radiation and that radiation then couples to the victim if your neighbor is drilling some holes and you cannot watch tv because of that that would be probably the idea and um since your neighbor is 10 meters away and your TV is receiving at 300 megahertz, then probably it's far field problem. Okay, that's how easy that is. Common impedance coupling is another problem which happens mostly in the circuits. You have uh, two parts of your circuit. You have a very noisy part like microcontroller or something similar. You have a victim which is an A to D converter or a amplifier so something that is sensitive and then you have a common ground impedance and then the power supply current from aggressor is running through that part and the consequence is that the voltage generated on that common resistance is then also seen by the victim and the calculations here not very hard is it This can really often happen in circuits and a lot of rules for designing the grounds are coming from this simple picture. And the other is uh, also similar. It's also common impedance coupling in case when you have a power supply that has some cables to the aggressor and to the same source you are attaching something very sensitive like again power drill and TV and that would be then in your house and in one socket you have tv on the other you attach power drill and you have again a problem of noise radiating through the cables now not through the air 
you would have problem radiating through the air, but also through the cables. And the cabling problem is the following. You have the noise current, which is red, and that noise current generates, the, the transfer here generates voltage noise drop on these two resistors. And this is then subtracted from the voltage that is seen by the victim. So the victim has some change in voltage here due to that current times the resistance twice. You can see that mostly in your uh, in the uh, mains uh, mains grid appliances. And finally, intended learning outcomes. So what did you learn or you should learn out of this lecture is that you are able to explain the physical EMC models with various sources, examples, paths and victims. So should be aware then to explain the principles of different origins and how you then reduce these. You should analyze a given situation. You should be able to analyze it and find out the most likely principle of electromagnetic coupling. And then you should be able also to calculate the amplitudes with the simple simplified coupling models for electric and magnetic noise and also resistive, of course. We will do some practice and also some examples on consultations. Till then, you can study this literature and I hope that you go well. So. We meet next week. I would really like to thank you for your attention and to stress that the EMC, the, this chapter is really important to understand in details, to get the feeling out from it, to get these basic relations right before, because that really then can help you with designing the circuit because you always have in mind what is going on in terms of EMC. And um, I must say, um, in old times, I'm not talking about very old times, I'm talking about 15 years ago, when they, um, they were employing for PCB layout, they were employing um, graphical designers. Totally other area, without any knowledge of electricity. They just, want, they just knew how to draw. And uh, PCB layout nowadays requires a lot of technical and electrotechnical knowledge in order to make it right and this is just the basic of it what i've shown you today so i hope that you liked it and um, i would really encourage you to study it in detail to really comprehend this knowledge and then use it every day in your life when designing electronics